So it turns out that your grandmother baking cookies for you every weekend might have actually been evolutionarily beneficial to females as a whole. Hello everyone, my name is Maya and I am joined again with my lovely gorilla companion Harambe. Another week and another set of questions that I am determined to find the answer to. And today my question stems around the idea of why women live so long after menopause when they're no longer capable of reproducing. So for those of you that are a little bit unaware, human females actually can live exceptionally longer after menopause or when they can no longer biologically reproduce. And evolutionarily, this doesn't really make sense because organisms are put on this earth to reproduce so that they can increase their fitness, pass on their genes to their offspring and continue their line throughout time. But if a certain organism can't reproduce anymore, then they have no evolutionary significance and they can't pass on their genes to any offspring because they can't have any. So that begs the question, why do women that have reached menopause continue living for decades afterwards? We don't see this in chimpanzees and other primates. Most chimpanzee mothers never outlive their reproductive capacity. That means that they usually die around or even before the time that they are supposed to stop reproducing. Producing. And this holds true for most other animals. Most animals will reproduce and then die shortly thereafter or have a bunch of bouts where they continue reproducing more offspring and then eventually grow older and die. But this extended period of time that we have after menopause is puzzling for us because we don't know why or how this evolved over the course of our evolution. Studies show that humans reach menopause the same time other primates would reach menopause. So it's not the fact that we're ending our reproductive stage earlier so that we can live longer. It's the fact that we end our reproduction at around the same time as other similarly related primate species, but we seem to live decades longer than these other primates. And I'm not talking about modern humans today because obviously we've extended our lifespan greatly by modern medicine, technology and other innovations. I'm talking about even hunter-gatherer societies today that have no access to the modern medicine that we speak of and have really just no technology available to them but the stone tools and weapons that they create to hunt. Life expectancy among these contemporary foragers is still about 20 to 30 years past menopause, which means that these ancient hunter-gatherer societies that are still living today with no access to modern medicine can still live 20 to 30 years after after menopause, which is highly unlikely for other animal species and even our closely related chimpanzee relatives. How did this evolve and why? Well, the first person to try to make sense of this post-reproductive period was a researcher called George Williams in 1957. He pointed out that older females that could no longer reproduce helped out their daughters by taking care of their grandchildren. When these grandmothers started helping out their grandchildren, they increased the chance of these offspring surviving, especially during the critical years of their childhood where they would have needed intensive care and support from as many relatives as possible. This taking care of your grandchildren could have increased the grandmother's fitness enough so that it could explain a long post-reproductive period, meaning that it would increase that individual's inclusive fitness. Now, for those of you that are unaware, fitness just means your reproductive success, which means that the more offspring that you can produce that survive on to following generations and continue reproducing, the higher your fitness is. Grandmothering or taking care of your grandchildren would hypothetically increase your inclusive fitness. Inclusive fitness is the idea that you're still increasing your fitness and the, your evolutionary success by spreading some of your genes around by helping and behaving altruistically to your relatives, cousins, daughters, and anyone that is related to you genetically because they still have some portion of your DNA. So as long as you're helping them and ensuring their success and their offspring's success, you're inadvertently increasing your own fitness and your own reproductive success. Basically, it pays to take good care of your relatives and behave altruistically altruistically towards them because you can still increase your own fitness by doing so. And particularly in humans, these grandmothers can do a lot to take care of their grandchildren. Taking care of children is not easy, especially when we were first starting out in small hunter-gatherer societies hundreds of thousands of years ago, we would have needed as many people as we could to help take care of children. If fathers were going out and foraging for food, this left the mother to take care of all her children. And depending on how many mounds she had to feed and how much food that the father brought back every day, it was a very precarious 
situation. Grandmothers could help decrease the load placed on mothers by their children by helping forage for food, feeding children that had been weaned, teaching children, because we know that human children are very helpless. They need a lot of guidance and a lot of teaching and a lot of nurturing to get them to slowly mature until the point where they are able to function on their own and don't need the help of other people. If grandmas could help take the load off moms, then that would have made it a lot easier for the mother to continue reproducing or take care or focus on her other children while making sure all these children actually survived and didn't just die early on because infant mortality was very very high in these societies. This hypothesis termed the grandmother hypothesis by Kristen Hawkes and other researchers in 2000 was novel at the time because when we think of early humans we think of these men and these hunter-gatherers going out and getting food for their wives at home and to feed children but very little focus is ever put on elderly individuals in societies and the roles that grandmothers can take to take care of their family and promote survival. It challenges the notion that men were the hunters who were going out and getting food and ensuring that their family was properly fed and provided all the resources. Grandmothers and other family members to a certain extent could have been some of the main propellers as to how we were able to increase our reproductive rates while also ensuring that these children actually survived and surpassed critical periods where there was a very high infant mortality. But how has this changed our life history? How has this changed the way that we reproduce and that we take care of our children today? Particularly, if grandmas were able to take care of children and feed them when they no longer needed mom's milk, that means that females could switch their focus from taking care of all their children to just specific children that needed them the most of the time. Which means that mothers could stop giving breast milk to children and switch them off to a grandmother who could start feeding them and focus on maybe another child or having more babies. So basically, moms could have more babies and wean them earlier and give them off to grandmas and focus on reproducing, which in the end would increase their own fitness. This would also shorten the amount of time between the next birth. So if a grandma was there to take care of a child, that means that you could wean off your kid and then focus on having another one as soon as you could. So the time between births would be shorter and the amount of children that you were having would be greater, which is great for everyone involved because it increases everyone's fitness. But how did this come into being? One day did elderly women just decide to start taking care of their grandchildren? If chimpanzees rarely live past their reproductive decline, then when in human evolution did we start adding years and decades to our life after menopause. So Williams and others actually posited that this was because of a concept called antagonistic pleiotropy. And it sounds really complicated, but it's a very simple concept. It just means that genes that suck earlier in life could actually have positive benefits later on in life. And this post-reproductive period could have evolved because of one of these sucky genes earlier on in life. Meaning that somewhere along the line, some mutation or some genetic alteration could have given an individual pretty crappy traits in the beginning of their life that maybe would have affected their their vigor, their fitness, their energy, their physical attributes but could have helped them later in life and could have added an extra couple of years and those years could have been used to take care of grandchildren thereby increasing that individual's inclusive fitness. The trait would then be selected for because it was evolutionarily advantageous and slowly and slowly more and more years would be added and it would be more beneficial to have this trait that allowed for a post-reproductive period. Think about it as a race and how some individuals might have an earlier start and some individuals might have a late start. Even though those individuals that have a late start are kind of unlucky because because they have to catch up in a shorter amount of time, they can still catch up and even surpass others, allowing them to cross the finish line and win. Except in this case, they're winning the evolutionary race, wherein they're increasing their own fitness by taking care of their relatives. And there's some evidence for the grandmother hypothesis as well. A study that looked at multi-generational demographic records from Canada in the 16 to 1700s found that grandmothers who were alive allowed their daughters to increase their offspring by two and to increase the number of their offspring surviving to age 15 by one, compared to when these grandmothers were dead. As the geographic distance increased between the grandmother and the mother, the number of offspring born and subsequently fitness decreased. Basically, the presence of a grandmother only led to positive effects on the female and her birth rates. Local grandmothers increased the offspring's chance of surviving, allowed for more offspring to be produced by their daughter, and increased the grandchildren's chance of survival. And even within hunter-gatherer troops today, for the Hadza in Tanzania, 
Changes in a child's weight is correlated to the grandma's foraging time. And other studies show that the survival of the maternal grandmother is significantly associated with grandchildren surviving. But they didn't find a significant result for the paternal grandmother, only for the maternal grandmother. Which is interesting because if the grandmother hypothesis holds true, then both grandmothers, regardless of whether they're maternal or paternal, should help increase offspring survival and birth rates for their daughter. Now obviously, no hypothesis comes without its criticisms, so let's look at some of the critiques of the grandmother hypothesis. Overall, I think the hypothesis overlooks the importance of other family members, like obviously fathers, grandfathers, and other siblings. In modern hunter-gatherer societies today, men provide an enormous amount of food and calories to their families through the food that they hunt and forage for. Older siblings can also take care of children and do other domestic chores that moms can't do when they're taking care of their young babies. Grandfathers, in a sense, can be just as helpful as grandmothers. And in one hunter-gatherer tribe, the Ache from Paraguay, the presence of grandmothers doesn't really affect offspring survival or birth rates at all. It's also important to note that most hunter-gatherer societies today and that were present a very, very long time ago were male-dominated. This means that most of the times the females would actually disperse from their natal troop or the tribe that they were born into to their husband's group and live in their husband's tribe. Which means if they dispersed, then most of the times their mom wasn't even available to them to help take care of their children. So in a lot of these cases, grandmas or senior females wouldn't even be able to help daughters because the daughters would have relocated to be with the husband in a completely separate tribe. In Hawk's original paper talking about the grandmother hypothesis, she uses the Hadza hunter-gatherers as a source to draw her conclusions from. But it's important to note that the Hadza are at the extreme end of the spectrum. Hadza grandmothers do a lot of work in foraging and provide a lot of food to their family and invest a lot of time and effort in taking care of their grandchildren. But other hunter-gatherer societies, for example the Ache, or male-dominated patrilineal societies, probably don't have as much investment by these grandmothers. So using the Hadza as an example might not be the best because they're such an extreme end of the spectrum in terms of grandmothering. And it's also important to factor in paternity uncertainty, which is a strategy that many female primates and humans probably used thousands of years ago to kind of get as much help and support for their offspring as they could. Paternity uncertainty works like this. When a woman is pregnant and she's giving birth to children, she knows for certain that that child is hers. But that's not always the case for the fathers. Obviously, genetic tests were not an option hundreds of thousands of years ago in these early hunter-gatherer societies. So males would just kind of have to take their word for it if the mom said, hey, that's your kid. In societies that weren't monogamous, men were probably copulating with multiple females at one time. And females were probably mating with multiple men at the same time as well. This constant mating probably made it really confusing to tell which kid was yours. Which means that females could get away with getting a lot more paternal support if they kind of mated around a lot because a lot of the men wouldn't know which kid was theirs. So they would just have to pitch in anyways because they didn't know. This paternity uncertainty could have led to a lot of men offering resources and helping to take care of a female's children because they just didn't know if it was theirs or not and it was better to help out than to not. And on the subject of men and fathers, many scientists have tried to come up with alternatives to the grandmother hypothesis that focuses on the post-reproductive lifespan of men as well. Because let's not forget, men can actually live pretty long past their post-reproductive period as well. Not as long as women, but still pretty long compared to other primates. One hypothesis to explain this, called the patriarch hypothesis, says that menopause is actually a byproduct of an adaptation in males. The patriarch hypothesis basically says that over the course of our evolution, men that could live longer were genetically selected for, because the fact that they could live longer means that they could potentially get another wife and produce more children, therefore increasing their dominance in society. These men that lived longer probably matured later on in life, which means that by the time that they had matured, they were stronger and bigger than most other men in the society, which allowed them to basically get any woman that they wanted and get multiple females, allowing them to increase their fitness. In the same vein of this antagonistic pleiotropy, where these bad effects in early life could become positive in later life, these men could have potentially lost out on a couple years of reproducing because they matured later, but then could have made it up and then some in their later years because they were stronger, more physically fit, and could take on more wives and produce more children. Then, since this longevity allele wasn't on the Y chromosome, it would then be passed on supposedly on the X chromosome to their daughters, which as a byproduct would lengthen the lifespan of their daughters as well. And once these daughters started outliving 
their post-reproductive period, then they could start grandmothering as a means of increasing their own inclusive fitness. The author of this hypothesis cites Australian aboriginals as an example, but also says that men are able to acquire wives after the age of 60, when they are clearly less physically fit than a 30 or 40 year old, saying that older men still have it shot with younger women, and this allows them to continue reproducing and increase their reproductive success. This handful of males that could have lived longer could have been passed down from generation to generation, and that's all it would have taken for a longer lifespan to evolve in males and, as a result, females. So all in all, while it seems like the grandmother hypothesis is this one-stop solution as to why women started living longer past their menopause, I think there's definitely a conversation to be had on the roles of other family members, particularly fathers and grandfathers and siblings, and I think the critiques of this hypothesis are also valid. There's definitely room for the idea that grandmothers were helping take care of their daughter's children, thereby increasing their own inclusive fitness and allowing for mothers to focus on producing more kids or taking care of the ones that they already had. But I don't think it can explain all these other variables changing, like women maturing later or having a shorter amount of time between births or a lower weight at weaning when the child stops receiving mom's milk. It's also important to note that, like I said before, a lot of females don't actually live close to their grandmothers physically, meaning that grandmothers in these contexts wouldn't even really be able to help their daughters because they weren't physically near them in these hunter-gatherer societies. This hypothesis could only potentially operate in a world where grandmothers are actually physically able and close enough in distance to help out their daughters. But I also don't think that the patriarch hypothesis is the answer. The author is kind of unclear with how the longevity allele is just kind of passed on to females because it's not on the Y chromosome and doesn't really offer a good explanation as to how females would have just casually inherited this allele. Also, many foraging societies and most modern humans today are monogamous. So even if a man managed to live longer, if he only had one partner, there's no way that he could just get more women without being ostracized by the society or labeled a huge cheater. It would have made more sense if he just continued reproducing and having children with his sole partner. This whole model of being a patriarch also relies on the idea of dominance ranking, which isn't really how a lot of societies work anymore Yes, there is some idea of dominance, but the idea of an alpha male existing in a human society doesn't really exist anymore because it's not like there's just one male that has access to all these females. That is indicative of a lot of primate societies, but it's certainly not indicative of all human societies anymore. And also, I have an issue with the author saying that just because they lived longer, this would allow them to mature later and become bigger and stronger. He doesn't really offer any evidence to suggest that this would be the case. Just because someone lives longer doesn't mean that they will inevitably somehow be stronger or more capable than other males in his group and rise to become a dominant male. Once again, the answer is that it's complicated. I think the grandmother hypothesis does a really good job at explaining why a post-reproductive period could exist in women and why females can live so long after menopause, but it doesn't really explain why men can also live a pretty long time after they cease sperm production. Personally, I like the idea of the grandmother hypothesis because it takes the focus off these strong men and kind of puts it back onto these hard working women that were striving to take care of their grandchildren and their daughters as best as they could and provide for their family. And that is something that is admirable and notable on its own. Humans cooperating together and working in groups efficiently is one of the reasons why we were able to become so successful today. These grandmothers could have made the difference between one of their grandchildren dying and that same grandchild being able to live a long happy life. So the next time your grandma bakes you a warm tray of cookies or gives you a ton of gifts for Christmas or showers you in her love and affection, just remember that the only reason she's doing that is to increase her inclusive fitness and her lifetime reproductive success. I'm kidding, kudos to all the grandmothers out there. You guys rock. We all appreciate you. And that, my friends, is all for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to give it a like. And if you're interested in more content about all things human, make sure to subscribe to my channel. It means a lot to me. And follow my Instagram if you would like updates on the videos that I plan on making next. Now Harambe and I are going to throw stones at each other like the fools that we are, but I will see you guys soon in my next video. Bye!